Gods, it's cold. Yarrow had to stifle a smile at his second shivered complaint. Cold? It's only been, what, 30 years? He pulled his pelt tighter around his shoulders as they huddled against the wind. They stood at the corner of Batro and Tom, in a sheltered arch before the city's western gates. Night had fallen, hard and heavy, and brought with it a storm, harder and heavier still. The light from a single torch illuminated the sleet-covered road, flickering as it was buffeted by the wind, but never quite going out. Long enough, Bellus grunted. The south has made us soft. Us? Yarrow laughed. In Kunsk, this is nothing more than a summer shower, a light rain to remind us of home. It's not so bad. Bellus raised a brow. Those pelts you've so eagerly wrapped yourself in say otherwise. Yarrow ignored him. It was cold. He could feel it in his bones, even beneath the thick layers of fur. He stepped forward, rubbing his hands together as he stared into the night. Shadows shifted, just beyond the light of the torch, as a milling mass of steel-clad shapes and black fur moved towards the city gates. The regiment was on the move. Where is he? Bellus lumbered up beside him and hissed warm air into the cold night. The last claw will be beyond the city wall soon enough. We cannot delay. We must wait. But for how long? Bellus spat. This lord tries my patience. For as long as it takes. Yarrow sighed and watched as his breath coiled in the air like wisps of smoke before the wind swept it away. He should be out there, at the head of the regiment with the rest of his lieutenants. We don't have a choice, he said, turning to Bellus. And we can't leave Veron to catch up with us, can we? The lieutenant shrugged, the roll of his massive shoulders still visible beneath his coat of fur. I suppose not, he replied, and with a shiver turned his gaze to the streets. The rain came to a faltering stop as the last of the hussars withdrew from the city, leaving Yarrow and Bellis alone beneath its walls. The air was still icy cold, and the wind carried with it the promise of another deluge. The miserable weather had kept the streets clear, which suited Yarrow just fine, but the delay had made him agitated, and his mood soured further with every minute that passed. He gritted his teeth and rubbed his hands together for warmth. Pride be damned, it was getting colder with every winter. There. Bellus was pointing with a clenched fist down the main thoroughfare. Pools of water had coalesced with the mud of the road, forming dense puddles of muck between the chipped flagstones. Water still ran in torrents from the tiled roofs that hung over them, flooding the gutters and overflowing onto the sidewalks above. A single light hovered in the distance, coming closer even as they watched. It bobbed up and down in a simple, inelegant rhythm, and eventually came to a stop before them. My apologies, Captain. Thelus Veron extinguished the lamp and smiled at Yarrow. He looked anything but apologetic. I was delayed by certain matters of the court. I do hope I have not inconvenienced you. He sat upon the back of a breed of horse Yarrow was not yet familiar with. Short and stocky, it was little more than a pony by his estimation, and yet its thickly muscled chest and legs looked out of sorts. Far too large for a pony, they seemed better suited to that of a charger or draft horse. Not at all, my lord, said Yarrow, eyeing the strange horse and ignoring Bellis's grumbled complaints at the delay. But we are quite ready to depart. The regiment will be some ways ahead by now. You are unaccompanied? He had expected one of the most powerful men in the city to have an escort of bodyguards, or perhaps even a warden. Yes, quite. Thelus smiled again, his pale skin seemingly translucent beneath the light of the moon. And if we could leave the formalities of the court to the court, Captain, this is hardly the place for such things. Yarrow nodded slowly, and Thelus chuckled, flashing his pearly white teeth at the captain. Thelus will do fine, he said, and nudged his mount toward the gates. Yarrow and Bellus exchanged bemused looks and headed out the postern gate behind them, to where their own mounts were waiting. A strange character, Bellus muttered as they passed beneath the wall. Don't let him hear you say that, Yarrow grinned. I hear he's a master duelist. Bah! <laughs> Bellus's hearty laugh echoed through the narrow passageway. All fops think they can duel until they meet widower. He patted the haft of the hammer at his side. On his ass in a minute or less, I bet on it. Yarrow's own laughter joined his as they exited the other side of the wall and into the pitch black of a winter's night. West now, the regiment marched, through the black hills of Rayans, beyond its grey fields and wooded glens, silver rivers and brick roads, 
They moved with purpose, a relentless pace that saw the golden glow of the city fall behind them before the moon could reach its zenith. Snow began to fall, settling on the plated armor of the hussars, across the shoulders of the hills and the beckoning limbs of trees. Torches and lanterns were lit once the city fell from view, and the numb fingers of shivering hands were given some respite from the cold. At dawn, Yarrow finally relented, and the regiment settled into a slower, lumbering gait. I tried to think of all the king's lands with affection, said Bellus, extinguishing his lantern. But gods, I hate this place. It is morbid, answered Alina, pulling her Ashanka down tighter over her ears as she frowned out toward the stunted forest. Yarrow flexed his fingers in his gloves, shifting in his saddle as Sumera trudged through the snow, but said nothing. The forest was sparse and blotchy, like the first hint of hair on a boy's face. It seemed to hover rather than grow from the land, and cast short shadows over the snow. Nothing to eat in there! Bellus ruffled the hair on Duke's neck, just above the straps of his armour, and glanced up into the trees. Unless you got a taste for crows. Yarrow smiled at Duke's rumbled complaint and stared out into the forest as his lieutenant continued the one-sided conversation. Strenge, with not so much meat on them. And they taste like the rotted flesh they eat. He made a face before spitting at the snow. We'll find you a river sturgeon once we reach the Iron Pass. Or maybe we'll look upon a fat little sheep just waiting for you. Catch me in the river on a day like this. Alina wriggled down into her furs. Not bloody likely. Yarrow snorted. We won't have time for a picnic by the river, as much as I'd like to see Bellis put more than a toe in the pike. He stood up in his saddle, bracing his legs against Sumera's flanks as he stared out at the regiment. The forest had forced the claws into a single column that wound its way through the snow-strewn valley. Banners streamed above them, flapping gracelessly as the wind wrenched at the cold hands of their bearers. Kurov's first, the bone claws, Urin's fang. Seldom had all of the claws been dispatched in a single campaign. Yarrow felt a momentary flush of pride. They would get the job done. Of that he was certain. He nodded to Abrov as the lieutenant and his company passed them by his great, greying accussion towering over some of the younger bears in the claw. Abrov tilted his head in return, before snapping out an order to his men, who quickly responded and picked up the pace. We'll reach the pass by sunset, said Bellus from over his shoulder. We keep going. Yarrow prodded Sumera forward, to ride alongside the regiment. Breach the pass, and set up camp once we've made it through. Misha and his scouts will meet. His words trailed off as he spotted the figure of Thelus amongst the regiment. Smothered by a thick coat of fur, the gangly figure of the lord made for a strange sight upon his stubby horse. To its credit, the horse seemed quite comfortable in the presence of the monstrous mounts that surrounded it, and was traversing the snow-stacked terrain with ease. Thelus glanced up, meeting Yarrow's eyes, and gifted him with another of his unsettling smiles, before drawing the reins of his mount toward the captain. "'Pleasant weather,' said Thelus, riding up beside him. His pale lips hinted at a tinge of blue." but he otherwise seemed unbothered by the cold. Yarrow stared up at the sky, into the milky white light that signaled dawn's breaking. The nights are growing longer, colder, he blinked back at Thelus, and the snow will make it harder for our trackers. I'm sure they'll manage, said Thelus, unperturbed by Yarrow's tone. There was a long pause, with just the crunching of snow beneath their mounts, and Sumera's deep breathing to fill the silence. Yarrow sighed softly into his collar. He could feel Thelus's eyes as they bore into him, staring a hole into the side of his head. No doubt the Lord was waiting for Yarrow to entertain him, to regale him with bloodthirsty tales of heroism and conquest. It was always the same with the nobles, even if Thelus's lips were bluer than his blood would ever be. "'Why do you serve the king?' said Thelus. The question was unexpected, and Yarrow almost laughed as he turned to face him. "'For the same reason that you do.' He spread his hands, still gripping Sumera's harness. Duty. Thelus blinked at him. That is not why I serve. Power, then. Wealth. Position. He frowned. No. It was something else. He was being tested. But Thelus was far too clever for it to be so obvious. You insult me. Thelus smirked and shook his head. Or misunderstand me. No matter. These are things I had before I entered Bayan's service. He shrugged, falling deeper into his fine cloak as he did so. My family has prospered, that much is obvious. Our states have grown numerous and large. Every river cutter and barge that enters the city bears the seal of Veron, and our coffers overflow with coin. But I only hastened the inevitable by entering Behan's service. The noble families are weak, unwilling to adapt. They lack vision, Captain. 
Yarrow raised a brow. I could not comment on the state of the king's court. You couldn't, Thelus said, grinning broadly. I'm sure you're familiar with the mindless scrabbling among its denizens. You'd just rather not involve yourself. Smart. He shrugged, but did not disagree. He cared little for the games that nobles occupied themselves with, and even less for the politics of the court. He studied Thelus from the corner of his eye, watching him as he rolled his long fingers across the horn of his saddle. The movement was delicate, precise. There was something about the man that unnerved him. Perhaps it was the way he moved. Every action seemingly calculated, every motion designed to bring about its desired goal as efficiently as possible. Such economy of movement would make him a tough opponent in the dueling square. Maybe not quite as tough as Bellis or Alina, but close enough. The Lord caught his eye for a moment, cold and piercing, and returned his hands to the warm layers of his cloak. They are an unimaginative bunch, my fellow nobles, he continued, rolling his hips in time to his horse's slow canter. It is a shame, really. With their wealth and power they could do much, but no, they are content with their games, with their trivial pursuits. He shook his head disdainfully. How many of them would survive out here, I wonder? Few, I'd think, said Yarrow with a frown, staring into the snow. Bellis and Alina had pulled off the trail and were waving at him urgently from up ahead. They must have been trying to get back to the city, said Bellis as Yarrow joined them, before the storm got them. A family, if I had to guess, but it's hard to be sure. Yarrow let out a sad sigh as he stared down at the ground. Half submerged beneath a thin layer of snow lay four figures, their bodies still locked together in a final embrace. Their features turned black from exposure. They'd sought comfort in the moments before the end. He glanced along the trail, looking for the telltale signs of more victims, but there were none. Bad luck, muttered Alina, loosening her grip on Warcheck's reins to allow him to move in closer. His massive pads left deep furrows in the snow as he approached, and he lowered his head to sniff at the corpses. Bella scowled at her. Have some respect. His voice carried a note of warning, and Duke responded to his tone, snapping his fangs at the younger bear. Warcheck bristled for a moment, revealing his own fangs as he sized up Bellis's mount. He evidently thought better of it, and lowered his head in submission before moving away from the corpses. Testy, said Alina, glaring at Duke before turning her eyes to Bellis. They're already dead. He meant no harm. Bellis's expression softened. Until the proper rites have been observed, they must be left in peace. He dragged his eyes away from the bodies and thumped a fist against his chest. Else they'll be trapped here forever in half-death, never to find Uren's halls. They're southerners, Alina snorted. They don't know our gods, and if they did... She curled a hand around her saddle horn and leaned forward, scrutinizing what little she could see of the bodies. They wouldn't worship them anyway, not if they valued their lives. All the same, said Yarrow bringing the discussion to a halt. We will afford them the proper dignities. A burning! Bella scratched at his beard and stared into the snow, a slight wrinkle of doubt edging its way above his eyes. Yarrow nodded. But on the return, we cannot afford to dawdle here. Their souls will have to wait a little while longer. Bella grunted, at ease with the decision. It will do, he said with a wan smile. Alina rolled her eyes at the pair of them and pulled at Wachek's harness. You two can stay, she called from over her shoulder. I'll see if I can't find some more peasants for your congregation. Yarrow raised a brow and met Bellis's cheerless smile with one of his own. She's cold. Bellis tilted his head and shrugged, squinting after her as she rejoined the regiment. Oh, she's right, and the south has made us soft. The wind howled and screeched as it whipped across the tundra, buffeting them from all sides, pushing them deeper into their coats. Thick flakes of snow fell in curtains around the regiment, carried by heavy gusts of freezing air that tore into fur and armor. Yarrow gritted his teeth and leaned forward, into the wind. He could hardly see the ground before him, and his regiment had been reduced to black shadows moving in and out of his vision. Enough like home, no? Bellis bellowed over the storm. Not yet, Yarrow shouted back, hardly able to hear his voice over the wind. He caught sight of Bellis's large frame for a moment, hunched down in his saddle the same as him before he disappeared back into the storm. Sumera responded to his gentle prod, lumbering forward with greater speed to catch up with Bellis. They had made good progress, even in the face of the bludgeoning whims of winter's first real foray. Yarrow peered ahead, narrowing his eyes as the wind lashed against his face. Beneath the curtains of snow, like a castle in a storm, emerged the great walls of the Iron Pass. Mountainous slopes of black rock rose up from the ground, stretching across the snow-laden land as far as the eye could see. 
He tilted his head, searching for the broken ridges of the pass itself. There! Bellis waved a hand over his shoulder, gesturing slightly to the west of the route they were on. Barely visible beneath the towering rock face, the iron pass ran through the slopes, cutting deep into its walls. The ground beneath the slopes grew uneven, and was littered with jagged black rocks that stuck out like teeth from beneath the snow. The wind that had so tirelessly dogged their march slowly began to relent, and then lifted as they made their approach. Still, they pushed on, finally crossing into the open mouth of the pass as the moon rose above their heads. Yarrow could barely see his hand before him. Such was the gloom that hung between the narrow walls around them. He called for torches to be lit, and a warm glow soon blanketed the regiment. The storm is letting up, said Ochenko, the larger of the Yaslov twins. He removed his Ashanka and wiped the sweat from his brow, keeping an eye on his claw as they moved ahead. Gods know we could do with some respite. Yarrow straightened in his saddle as he stared across the trail. Little balls of golden light hovered into the distance like so many fireflies, slowly moving with the regiment as they navigated the pass. It's good fortune, he said, turning to Echenko. But I fear it will not hold for long. Aye, Echenko said with a smile, not letting Yarrow's words dampen his mood. But maybe long enough for us to get through, eh? Udin can give us that, I think. Perhaps, murmured Yarrow, but he looked far from convinced. Tired from the grueling ride, his back ached, and a chill had wormed its way into his bones. He was getting old. He had been for some time. Soon, someone younger, someone stronger, would have to take his place. Then he would retire to the keep, perhaps take Umber's place once the Swordmaster sheathed his blade for good. Else what? The hussars were all he knew, all he'd known for more years than he could count. He ground his teeth and pushed the thought to the back of his mind, with the pain. Quit your dawdling, called Bellus, a black outline on the ridge ahead of them. We got traitors to kill. They marched through endless slopes of scree, navigated their way past boulders as wide as city gates, and clambered between the jagged rocks that dominated the pass. Yarrow fell into a steady rhythm, swaying in time with Sumeru's gait, his mind focused on little but the ground before him. As the first grey light of dawn struggled over the pass, he found himself riding beside Bellus and Lord Veron. For a while they rode in silence, Thelus's own mount dragging its hooves through the snow, while the Akashans moved with ease. Unfortunate, Thelus's mouth curled down as he looked sidelong at Yarrow. To freeze to death is particularly unpleasant, so I've heard. Yarrow heaved a heavy sigh. It is not a fate I would wish for myself, or any other. The gods can be cold-hearted at times, said Bellus, gazing into the heavens above. It was no different in Kunsk. When the deep night came, families would perish in their sleep, entire households wiped out because they were too proud to ask for help. Sometimes we blame the gods for the foolishness of men, muttered Yarrow. Thelus stroked thoughtfully at his cleft chin with a fingertip. You do not believe all things are fated? Sometimes I don't believe in the gods at all, said Yarrow. Then I wonder who else we'd blame for this mess. You can blame it on the rebellion and this pauper prince, snorted Bellus. They'd see the kingdom in ruins and us cowering at the feet of their new gods. There was something reassuring about Bellus's presence by his side. His second was more warrior than philosopher, but he had a way of seeing the world that cut through all the chaff. Not so new, said Thelus with a thin smile. Older than some, in fact. Maybe even your god. Bellus shook his head and laughed lazily. Older than time itself, then? Perhaps not, Thelus conceded. But the worship of the twins goes back many years. We must be careful not to underestimate the brother and the sister. They have tapped into something the lower castes have not had in some time. Hope. It gives them strength. A strength mere numbers alone could not afford them. Bah! Bella spat, still shaking his head. New or old, their gods won't protect them from us. Yarrow frowned. He had read a little of the twins over the last year, enough to recognize the danger they posed. Is it true what they say about their noble families in the eastern principalities, that they've embraced these new gods as their own? It is, Thelus replied, and lifted the prohibition on worship. Not like the nobles to give up ground, Thelus murmured, before glancing at Thelus. If you don't mind me saying. Not at all, Thelus waved a hand dismissively. It was sudden. The king found his own blood, his brothers and sisters, embracing the faith. As you can imagine, his response has been ruthless, Yarrow grunted. The Imperial Navy's blockade of the Greater Sea had left thousands dead, and united thousands more against the throne. 
Behan's armies had moved east to put pressure on the principalities, but to no avail. Minor skirmishes had followed, nothing decisive, but enough to further sour the king's mood. Things have become difficult, said Thelus. He dragged at his reins, pulling his mount through a narrow incline and back onto the path beside Yarrow. The king's armies are still weak after the Akasha campaign. We lost too much there, and spent too long in that god's forsaken land. We are not yet ready for another war. But this will end all that. Bella smacked a meaty fist into the palm of his hand, glancing back at the lord. With a single blow we'll bring the traitors to their knees. Thelus pursed his lips, his eyes narrow. Do not be so sure. The bulky lieutenant raised a brow at that and leaned back in his saddle. But without leadership, the rebellion will surely fail. Thelus shrugged. Martyrs are as dangerous as generals in an army of the faithful. Keziah's death has shown us that. Yarrow cocked his head and turned to him. You think it was a mistake to have him killed? He had been in Vorgar when he'd heard the news, and had thought little of it at the time. He thought back to the humid forests that covered the savage lands. Too hot in summer, and too cold in winter, but that was the way it was in Vorgar. Search for balance there, and you'd be sorely disappointed. The king does not make mistakes, said Thelus, waving away the notion. No, the fault lies with his lords. To perform such a thing in public was foolish, but they would not heed my words of caution. They could not have foreseen the consequences, said Yarrow. He curled his lips and spat out into the snow. But now the people want their vengeance. Can you blame them? Thelus's voice had an edge to it he had not noticed before. We killed their saint, outlawed the worshipping of their gods, and forced them to fight in our wars. He shook his head. I'm surprised it took them this long. You sympathize with them? I pity them. Yarrow frowned into his collar and forced Sumera on up the slope. The trail grew narrower here, the black rock face hemming them in on both sides. His regiment was forced to move in single file, and a line of black fur and shining steel wound its way along the path, moving ever forward toward the ridge. As they moved closer to the edge of the pass, his thoughts turned to Thelus's words. His old captain, Kurov, had ingrained in him a skepticism of the will of the people, of mob rule. The people want what's best for them, Always, he'd said. But they do not always know what that is. This is the domain of gods and kings. Anything else was doomed to fail. They called Behan a tyrant, but Yarrow had been to the so-called free cities of Hath and cared little for the perversion of social order he'd seen there. Vorgar had no king, at least not that he was aware of, and they'd failed. Their civilization was one of blood and soil, and they'd quite given up on the latter. Chieftains and warlords battled for control of the tribes. Blood feuds survived generations and set one village against another in never-ending conflict, all because someone's ancestor had murdered another's. No, Varin needed a king, a firm hand to guide it through peacetime and war. He was loyal, but he was no fool. He knew King Behan had erred in the past and that his hand hit hard when it should be open in friendship, but that didn't matter. The worst of kings was better than the alternative. I've heard talk of massacres in the eastern cities, said Yarrow, putting his thoughts into words. Cities that now worship the twins. Ah, Thelus nodded grimly. We have the order to thank for that. They've taken it upon themselves to purify the cities. Purify? Bellus asked, creasing his brow. Fortune tellers, palm readers, spirit dancers, anything that poses a challenge to the faith. Bellus barked out a laugh. If these charlatans threaten this faith, it can't be very strong to begin with. All the same, Thelus shrugged, there is some cunning to be found in the Order's actions. Heresy has been defined broadly by their theogitators. Political dissidents, undesirables, allies of the monarchy, they are branded as witches and hunted down by the Order militant. Brutal, but effective. Respect. And who could blame him? The rebellion had moved in an endless tide across the eastern territories and brought high and lowborn into their god's flock. And this is what the people want? Yarrow's forehead wrinkled with disbelief. It seems a poor exchange. Give them their gods. He could understand that, at least. He'd never quite understood the hatred King Behan bore for the twins. Then again, he'd spent half his lessons with the law weaver in a half-sleep. What they want is to worship their gods in peace, said Thelus. To do so, certain sacrifices must be made. Bellus snorted and reined Duke in beside Yarrow. The path ahead was opening, the steep incline slowly evening out. You seem to know a lot about this order, said Yarrow, 
He flexed his fingers in his gloves, feeling the warm leather against his skin, and stared down the ridge. A thick forest lined the trail where the iron pass receded. Dense thickets of tanglewood and birch clawed up into the sky, casting long shadows over the snow. In the distance, Yarrow could just make out the outlines of the four pillars. The stony mounds, as tall as citadels, imposed themselves on their surrounds. They were close now. It is my job to be informed, said Thelus. He waved a hand about before glancing at Yarrow. If ever there came a day that we were forced to entreat with a rebellion, gods forbid, it would be prudent to know what it is they're fighting for. Yarrow could only nod at that. Understand the mind of your foe. The one rule Kurov had failed to follow himself. But things have become more complicated, Thelus continued. This alliance between the eastern cities is born out of more than just religious necessity. The people have tasted freedom, and now they thirst for it. I fear nothing Behan could offer would quench that desire. Even if the war were to end today, the seed has been planted and will not be easily removed. Then we'll just have to sow salt into the earth. Bellus laughed again, but less confidently than before. The Lord's words had unsettled him and Yarrow felt the first inkling of doubt shadow his own thoughts.